Hello and welcome to the panel uh, titled The Bonds That Make Us for the 2021 Undergraduate Research Symposium at the University of Oregon. I am your moderator, Bronwyn Maxson. I work at UO Libraries um, with instruction and in undergraduate engagement, as well as Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin American studies. And I will be introducing each panelist before they, uh, before they give their panel. And uh, each panelist will have, each poster, poster presenter will have three to five minutes eat, And then um, at the end, we'll do a Q&A for everyone. So throughout this presentation, you are welcome to put questions for our poster presenters into the Q&A um, in Zoom. And please do your best to uh, include who the question is for. So please include their name when at all possible. Um, and some questions we will respond to in writing, other questions we will address verbally at the end after everyone has given um, their presentation. So to get us started, we have Sarah Bowden with anion exchange membrane electrolyzers for dirty water splitting. Great, thank you. Just, uh, I'm not sure if I should be sharing screen, but it is disabled. Yes. Okay. Ellie, oh, sorry, sharing video, not screen. Ellie, can you um, help us out? Thanks. Still disabled on the. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're viewing your screen. Right. OK. OK, great. So um, thank you for that. So hello, I'm Sarah Bowden, and I'm a sophomore chemistry major. Uh, over the last year, I've worked as an undergraduate researcher in the Betcher Lab under the mentorship of PhD candidate Grace Lindquist and Dr. Shannon Betcher. Our work involves the development of anion exchange membrane electrolysis. Electrolysis, also known as water splitting, is the use of an electrolyzer to create uh, hydrogen and oxygen gas, which can be seen here. Uh, this can be done via renewable energy. The hydrogen gas can then be used as a clean energy source, which can mitigate the need for polluted fossil fuels. In this way, the development of clean hydrogen fuel production is a necessary step towards increasing the effectiveness and scalability of renewable energy. Uh, two types of common electrolyzers are the cation exchange membrane, or CEM, and the anion exchange membrane, or AEM, both of which use a solid polymer electrolyte instead of a liquid, which allows for operation in water instead of a caustic and harsh electrolyte, such as a KOH solution. The CEM is the current industry standard due to its high hydrogen purity. However, these electrolyzers are sensitive to contaminants and require expensive platinum group metal catalysts and hardware due to the harsh acidic conditions. Uh, the AEM, on the other hand, may have a greater tolerance for ionically impure water and doesn't require expensive hardware and catalysts for that exact reason. Um, some issues with this technology are that it has known membrane instability and is overall underdeveloped which has resulted in a lack of baseline knowledge. So much interest recently has been focused on the development of an anion exchange membrane system that has a high tolerance for contaminated water, such as seawater or tap water. This technology would increase the system durability and decrease the risk of expensive system damage, therefore increasing the accessibility of green hydrogen fuel production. Uh, however, one technical barrier for this technology is the competing reactions of chlorine and oxygen gas at the anode in a sodium chloride solution, which would simulate saltwater conditions. Uh, these three poor bay plots demonstrate the energy required in volts to produce the predominant thermodynamic product at varied pHs. As you can see by the green line and the black line, oxygen gas is favored over chlorine gas at applicable pH levels, which for us is low pH. Um, but as seen in figure A, this difference is sometimes small and needs to be researched more thoroughly in order to decrease the possibility of toxic chlorine gas evolution. Uh, secondly, the introduction of ionic species in the electrolyte increases numerous degradation pathways, which can damage and decrease the efficiency of the system. In order to learn more about these barriers, we used an H cell and a membrane electrode assembly in combination with a potentiostat. The H cell setup was used for ion crossover measurements because it offers greater accessibility of electrolyte testing at the anode and cathode where it's actually physically open, as you can see. 
while the membrane electrode assembly was used for electrochemical measurements. Uh, shown below is our H cell testing results, wherein sodium chloride was introduced at the anode and pure water was at the cathode. Uh, and these results indicated that the crossover of sodium cations to the cathode due to diffusion was blocked under sufficient current density. As you can see, the higher current density, uh, the less crossover we're seeing. From this, uh, we can assume that all ion crossover may be current density dependent. And this knowledge can be used to control uh, ionic species within the cell and mitigate the risk of unwanted products such as chlorine gas or sodium hydroxide evolution. And then in order to learn more about the hypothesized degradation of the membrane polymer and various catalysts, we tested two different catalysts for the oxygen evolution reaction at the anode in carbonate solution measuring for impedance and long-term stability. We used carbonate as our electrolyte instead of sodium chloride like before, because carbonate is also present at significant concentrations. Uh, it has been known to poison electrolyzers and fuel cells, and less is known about carbonate as a general uh, electrolyte. As for our catalysts, we chose to compare iridium oxide and lead ruthenium oxide because we know that chlorine reactivity competes with oxygen evolution when using the iridium catalysts and that the lead ruthenium catalyst has been previously shown to favor the oxygen evolution reaction. So we want us to learn more about how these known characteristics might be affected in both pure water and carbonate solution. Uh, from our stability data, which is seen below, we can see that the cell maintains low voltage as time goes on, unlike the iridium oxide in pure water, which uh, indicates long-term efficiency. So as the voltage stays low, uh, that means that the efficiency is staying high. As voltage increases, it means that we're losing efficiency. But according to, to the impedance plot of the iridium oxide and carbonate, um, which is seen above, we can see that the resistance is decreasing over time, the real resistance in ohms, um, as the electrolyzer undergoes a long run. So this impedance data is actually taken periodically throughout the stability run shown below. Uh, then at around 80 hours in the stability run, we can see that the cell shorts, which is resulting in this unexpected change in voltage. Just a few seconds to wrap up. Great. Okay. Thank you. So our, our hypothesis is that the degradation is occurring in both pure water and sodium carbonate solutions, but the presence of the ionic species uh, hides the degradation in consequential voltage increase until the membrane developed a tear entirely. So this really helped us better understand the effects that ions could have on the system. Uh, in the future, we need to look at non-PGM, uh, non-platinum group metal catalysts, which have the potential to reduce capital costs further and increase the accessibility of green hydrogen gas. So are there any questions? Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, and a reminder, we'll do questions at the end. And I do believe panelists, uh, poster presenters, you can turn your cameras on if you want to. Um, it's not required. Um, next, we have... Leila Biberich with charge state impact on protein gas phase structure simulated with molecular dynamics. Go ahead, Leila. Hi, thank you for the introduction. So for the purpose of this presentation, I did change my title to do proteins keep solution phase structure in the gas phase. Uh, so Proteins are pretty important to study for a variety of reasons. One of them being is to understand their function, and we can do that using um, experimental methods. And some of those experimental methods use um, gas phase techniques. So the question can become, how can we learn more about the structure of a protein in the gas phase? Um, especially, or perhaps you can also ask why, um, how you can learn about that when these experimental techniques don't reveal the whole entire picture. So upon transfer from solution into the gas phase, um, a protein might stay exactly the same or it may change somewhat. And we're interested in knowing um, where in this range is the true structure of the protein. One way that we can go ahead and look at that is by using collision cross-section. Um, and this technique, you can think of collision cross-section as basically the um, average shadow, uh, average shadow area of a protein. And with that, um, we can go ahead and also ask, so how does a protein uh, change, how does the collision cross-section of a protein change with different charge states? 
And we're interested in that because uh, a charge, a protein itself can have a couple of different native charge states. And it'd be nice to know when you transfer that to the gas phase, do they stay the same or do they change? And what does that structure look like? So the way that we went about this is um, we used methods previously determined in our lab. So we had different three different proteins. We placed an appropriate amount of charges on them. We used in vacuo, in vacuo and desimulations. We conducted collision cross-section calculations. And we also went and looked at different um, structural, we conducted different structural analyses. The three proteins that we used were beta-lactoglobulin, concannabulin A, and glutamate dehydrogenase. And the nice thing about these proteins is that, as you can see down here, they represent a wide um, variety of masses. And so we have like a very small protein and um, a, very, a very big one over here. So the first thing that I mentioned that we did were in vacuo MD simulations. Um, and that is shown right over here. So these are just a few of the structures um, for each of the native charge states, which are listed here. And as you can see, uh, what I've done here is I've colored all of the beta sheets in black and the alpha helices in orange, and I've kept the, um, the loops with the original structures over here. The interesting thing about some of these proteins is that when you're just visually looking at them, you might notice how in the seven plus charge state of beta-lactoglobulin, there is um, an, an alpha helix right here. And the same thing is shown in the eight plus, but you don't see that in the nine plus. So these are just some of the things that we were looking at um, when we were conducting in vacuo and simulations. And so the next part of the project was conducting the, cross, the collision cross-section calculations. And this plot over here shows the some of the experimental results um, from the Matt Bush database obtained using native mass spectrometry. And you'll notice that there's um, across a protein's charge state, there's a pretty flat trend for all of them. And then with our proteins simulated um, computationally, we see that exact same trend of, of flat, that flat trend across um, native charge states. And that's, that's good because it, it matches up with what we would see experimentally. And because of that, we were able to go ahead and conduct a few more uh, structural analyses. And so those are listed over here. And ultimately what we're doing was we were looking for global trends and seeing what can we learn about the specific structure of, of proteins upon using this method. Um, and a couple of them, for example, the interior collisional cross-section, which is where we would be looking at the interior of a protein and performing the same CCS calculations, we noticed a percent decrease in collision cross-section for all of the proteins in all of their native charge states. And that can be shown over here uh, visually where the blue represents the simulated structure after MD, and then the orange represents the, the original um, structure that we started off with. But then for some, other, for some other metrics, so for example, secondary structure, we'll notice that over here, uh, we see a variety of different things. So for a big protein like glutam uh, glutamate dehydrogenase, we'll see a net percent, um, a negative percent change in secondary structure. But then for something like concannabulin A, there was um, a positive percent change. And this might be because- I just decided to interrupt just a few seconds to wrap up. Oh, sure. Yeah, so we're still doing some ongoing work over here, and this is a different question that we're also asking right now, but ultimately what we can say is that compaction and charge dipole interactions appear to cancel for native protein ions spanning a wide range of mass. And I just quickly like to thank my PI, Dr. Jim Prowl, my graduate research mentor, Amber, um, as well as the entire Prowl Lab and our sources of funding. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And I see uh, you've already got a question waiting for you in the Q&A, so um, great work. Next, we have Phyllis Liao with development of a nanohoop rotaxane uh, for sensing reactive oxygen species. Cool. Oh, okay. great. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Phyllis, and I am presenting on my research of development of a nanohoop rotaxane for sensing reactive oxygen species. 
Um, just like a quick intro, the JASTI lab is an organic synthetic lab, and it specializes in carbon nanohoops, um, officially coined N-cycloparaphenylenes, or NCPPs, where N represents the number of benzene rings inside the CPP. And it also has size-dependent fluorescence, so as the number of benzene rings decrease, it redshifts. And I'm leveraging the CPP in um, a structure called mechanically interlocked molecules, which is defined as a molecule held together by physical bonds and cannot be separated without breaking a chemical bond between the atoms. And one particular type of mechanically interlocked molecule is the rotaxane. Um, so like some interesting properties about mechanically interlocked molecule is that it has um, highly selective molecular recognition sites that would be difficult to access using traditional covalent bonds. Um, the ring of our interest for the rotaxane is the CPP, and there's also a modular linear component that can be threaded inside the CPP. And then it uh, has two stopper groups at the end to prevent any de-threading outside of the CPP. Um, so some previous work detecting hydrogen sulfide using the nanohoop-based rotaxane sensing platform uh, is indicated here. So like, here, there is the 2,4-dinitrophenylester that acts as the trigger and the quencher of the CPP. So as you can see, it starts out as non-fluorescent and as hydrogen sulfide attacks that trigger component, it breaks apart and then the CPP is released and this affords a turn on fluorescence response. Uh, so the modular component, it comes from these two stopper groups and I can change out the 2,4-dinitrophenyl ester into something that can detect other types of biologically relevant analyzes. Um, and then additionally, the JASTI lab is also uh, has done a lot of research on derivatives of CPPs. So in particular, there is the meta-nitrogen doped six-ringed CPP that I've like indicated down here in the bottom left. It has a like a neon yellow uh, fluorescence and it starts out with four starting materials and in eight steps you can synthesize this um, meta nitrogen 6 CPP. So all of this provides a foundation for a modular sensing platform where the sensing component can be interchangeable to react with different biological analytes. And the biological analyte that I've chosen for my project is reactive oxygen species. So reactive oxygen species are a source of oxidative stress and an imbalance of it is connected to severe human diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disorders, and neurodegenerative diseases. And my goal is to synthesize a nanohoop based for taxane to sense reactive oxygen species. And the particular structure that actually reacts with the ROS is this born ester trigger that I've indicated in red. Um, so just like hydrogen sulfide reacting with this trigger component, I have reactive oxygen species reacting, chemically reacting with this trigger component. And um, a big part of my project is actually synthesizing these novel structures. Um, I started out with a 4-bromobenzaldehyde and a 3,5-dinitrobenzaldehyde um, to, to yield this first stopper group. And then the fluorescence quencher, I remained the same as the previous hydrogen sulfide uh, thread here. So it is also still that 2,4-dinitrophenyl two, ester. Um, and then I go undergo an active template method to thread these two components into the CPP. Um, specifically, I use the active template Cadio, Cadio, Cadio Chokowitz reaction, where I use a copper reagent to coordinate with the 2,6-pyridine that I've incorporated in the meta-nitrogen 6 CPP. Um, so you can see here in this cartoon that the copper reagent coordinates with the nitrogen, and then it brings the uh, halo, uh, yeah, the halo alkyne, and then the alkyne pieces of the two stopper groups together to make that one linear component. And then the copper reagent just goes back into its catalysis cycle. And then here you can see it's mechanically interlocked now, so it's only held by those physical bonds. And this is my resulting structure. It's the uh, or an ester trigger here, and then my fluorescence quencher stopper group here. Um, so for some future directions, this entire synthetic process proved to be quite non-trivial. So optimizing the synthesis and purification for a better yield on all of these trigger components, and then the resulting nanohoop-based rotaxane. Um, I'm also going to- One seconds left, Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm also going to characterize the structure and then introduce a reactive oxygen species such as hydrogen peroxide 
into simple non-biological environments using like a buffer with a pH of seven to simulate physiological conditions. And then I'll assess its ability to operate in living cells. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank Ramesh Jasti, my PI, and then also Claire Audison, my graduate mentor. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, next we have um, Amanda Linskins with Molecular Origins of the Pair One and Moonwalker Descending Neurons Neural Circuitry in Drosophila. Hello, thank you for that introduction. So neural circuitries are very important in order for neurons to communicate with each other. That way we can display some kind of function through such as movements. So for looking at neural circuitries, we decided to use the Moonwalker descending neurons, also known as the MVNs, which uh, synapse and form a circuitry with the pair one neurons. Um, and so these two neurons are able to control backwards movement in Drosophila, also known as fruit flies. And we decided to focus on them because they're both very well characterized in both their function and morphology within the fruit fly brain. So, the MDNs are able to activate this backwards locomotion, and they're able to have axons that descend all the way down into the ventral nerve cord, also known as the VNC. And so these are, so these are able to activate uh, premotor neurons, and the pair ones are also located in the brain and have axons that descend into the VNC, so they can also activate premotor neurons. So like every other neuron, the MDNs and pair ones are formed from neuroblasts, which are also known as neural stem cells in mammals. So before the embryos hatch into larvae, the neuroblasts are able to divide into progeny neurons in distinct temporal windows that are marked by their own temporal transcription factor expression. So the way this works is as the neuroblast develops throughout time, it first expresses this first um, temporal transcription factor hunchback, and then as it divides to the progeny neurons, the progeny neuron is able to inherit hunchback, but the neuroblast is able to continue on to the next temporal transcription factor. So the temporal transcription factors that we'll be focusing on include hunchback, croupal, caster, and grainy head. And these temporal transcription factors are just important for influencing the expression of very specific genes within these neurons to give them their specific identity and function. So our big goal is to determine which temporal transcription factors the MDN and pair one neurons derive from and examine how morphology and behavior is affected in the larvae when the temporal transcription factor that these derive from are knocked down or overexpressed. So the way that we are able to do this is through the GAL4 UAS system. So in very specific um, neurons, such as the MDNs or pair ones, um, the green fluorescent protein is able to be expressed, also known as GFP. So what we're able to do from this is dissect the larval brains, antibody stain for the GFP, along with the different temporal transcription factors, and analyze these images. So the, re the results from this can be seen in figure six and figure seven. So in the top image here with A, we have GFP, which is staining um, for MDN or pair one. And then in B, we have the hunchback staining. And then in C, we have the composite of these two images. So in green, we have the GFP, and in magenta, we have hunchback. And what we're able to see from this is that um, hunchback strongly colocalizes with the GFP in both the MDNs and the pair one neurons. And we were also able to quantify this in the graphs below that show that hunchback strongly colocalizes with both of these neurons. And so what we were able to determine from this was that um, both hunchback, both um, MDNs and pair ones are derived from the hunchback temporal window. We were again able to, so with that, we wanted to look at what would happen if we were to knock down or overexpress hunchback. So again, we were able to do this with the GAL4 UAS system, but this time we used another UAS driver um, to either knock down or overexpress hunchback, specifically in the pair one neurons. So what we're able to see from this is again, in green, we have the GFP. So in the control, we see the two pair one neurons along with the axons. However, in the hunchback knockdown, we are still able to see the two pair one cell bodies, but the axons weren't descending. But then in the hunchback overexpression, we actually saw three um, cell bodies instead of just two. So with that, we thought that was pretty weird. 
And so we wanted to see how this could possibly affect behavior. So we decided to do this using optogenetically activated cation channels to turn on the pair ones when we wanted to turn them on. And so this was done by treating the one group of larvae with all trans retinol, also known as ATR, and another group with a uh, vehicle. So the way that this works is that when the red light is off, um, ATR, the vehicle group, the pair ones are off along with the ATR group, but when the red, the red light turns on, the pair ones are still off in the vehicle group, but the pair ones turn on in the ATR group. So when looking at these graphs, what we can see um, is that the red box is signifying when the red light is turned on. So with the blue here, that's the ATR group, and we can see that it is pausing and then turning, and then um, speeding. Just a few seconds left, Amanda. Okay. So speeding back up once the red light turns off. With the hunchback RNAi, we saw that it took a bit longer for it to um, turn back off, but with the overexpression, we saw that it was turning back on no matter how, um, no matter when the red light turned off. So what we hope to do from here is determine um, morphological and behavioral changes with the hunchback knockdown or overexpression. Um, and then basically determine um, with the MDNs what happens with this hunchback manipulation. And then we also hope to perform neuro mapping of the pair ones when hunchback is knocked down or overexpressed. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody at the Doe Lab along with Spur and NIH for funding this research project. Thank you so much. Um, each presentation is more impressive than the last. Um, you're, you're all doing really, really wonderful work. Um, next we have Faith Long Night with using kinetics to study the stabilization of reactive hydrosulfide by supramolecular receptors. Awesome, thank you for the intro. Um, so hydrosulfide or HS minus is an extremely reactive anion. However, it also has many physiological implications as it's the third endogenously produced gaseotransmitter, which means it's a crucial signaling molecule for our bodies. And the work that I'm doing studies the reactivity of this molecule, and it builds off the work of many others, um, including the synthesis of an organically soluble HS minus, which was done by UO's Pluth lab, or also previous kinetic studies that have studied similar compounds. Um, and interesting studies have also shown um, that HS minus has been bound through non-covalent interactions in proteins. So for this project, I want to see how non-covalent interactions utilized in a supermolecular receptor that was previously synthesized by other members of my lab can affect the reactivity of hydrosulfide. So in this project, I aim to study if the presence of a supermolecular receptor can influence the rate of a nucleophilic aromatic substitution or SNAR reaction. And we hypothesize that the non-covalent interactions in our receptor will help stabilize HS minus and reduce the rates. And this study can give us a better understanding of how HS minus is being stabilized in nature and in our bodies. As we know, um, the HS minus has really strong reactivity, so we know it has to be being stabilized somehow. So to start off this project, I had to synthesize an intermediate that I would be working with for the whole project. And a lot of work went into finding a good substrate to work with as it had to react slow enough um, to get good initial data from, but it also had to be fast enough not to have adverse reactions with our receptor as the receptor starts to degrade when it's in solution with TBASH for over two hours. And TBASH is the HS minus source that I'm using for the project. And we ended up working with NBD thioethers and the NBD thioether that I'm working with is shown down here in figure one. And these thioethers are UV active. So I'm able to use the UV vis to monitor the reaction. And they're also tunable, which is really helpful when trying to find that perfect balance in slow and fast reactions. And figure one shows a proton NMR, and proton NMRs um, show all the hydrogens that a molecule contains. And it's a proton NMR of the uh, molecule that I synthesized. And this was used to um, confirm that I had synthesized the correct product as well as purified it before I moved on with it. And then schemes one and two um, show the mechanism that I'm working with. So scheme one shows the synthetic mechanism of the reaction. Um, and you can see here that HS minus comes and does a nucleophilic attack of the aromatic ring, giving it the name nucleophilic aromatic substitution reaction. And then the molecule breaks apart into two different products. Um, and we can assume a similar mechanism occurs when we add in the receptor, which is shown in scheme two, except, um, and also this, the receptor is the big molecule that's binding HS minus in scheme two except now we expect some of the um, HS minus to be bound by the receptor and the unbound HS minus will be participating in that reaction. So from the data that I've collected so far, we're able to see that the receptor does slow down the reaction. 
And, look, and when looking at figure three, um, you can see that there's the closer succession of scans and mere number of scans preceding the peak. Um, when you compare it to figure two, indicates the reaction is slowed when the receptor is in solution. Um, and then I take this information from figures two and three, and I graph the absorbance at a singular wavelength versus time. Um, and that's shown in figure four. And you can see um, in figure four, the red line, which indicates that the receptor is present, has a more gradual slope when compared to the purple line, which is without the receptor. Um, and this again indicates that there's a slower rate when the receptor is in solution. And then I take these graphs and I obtain um, quantitative rates in MATLAB. Um, and I'm still in the process of doing this along with replicating the data. But overall, the preliminary data agrees with our hypothesis, the receptor slows down the reaction. Um, and this data can give us a better understanding of how Aegis minus is being stabilized in nature, as well as learn more about the behavior of the anion in general. Um, and as for future work, I want to try um, to change the concentration of the receptor, which would in turn affect the concentration of unbound Aegis minus, um, to see if that influences the rate kinetics in any way. Um, and I also think it would be interesting to study um, a deuterium labeled receptor, which just means that um, we would take our receptor and switch out um, the hydrogen here with a deuterium, which is a hydrogen isotope. Um, and this would be interesting to see if we can observe an equilibrium isotope effect um, through rate kinetic studies. Um, but yeah, I would like to thank everyone in my lab, particularly my mentors, Hazel and Thais, um, and then the Darren Johnson, Haley and Pluth labs as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Faith. Um, next up is Nathan Stovall with the molecular design of a metal oxide supported iridium monolayer for water oxidation catalysis. Nathan, we are seeing your screen. You may have to unmute yourself. Oh, my bad, that's hilarious. So yeah, I, I'm Nathan. And um, before I start talking about my specific work, I wanna talk a little bit about the motivation for it. And I'm sure you guys all have heard that there's a big push, or at least there should be, to decarbonize our energy infrastructure. And we have a lot of really cool technology right now. We have a lot of really good solar panels and a lot of really good like wind turbines. In fact, in many places on Earth, solar panels are the cheapest form of energy production. But what really limits the implementation of these clean energy technologies is we don't have a good way to store it. So using one of the technologies that um, Sarah talked about, we can actually split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And it turns out that hydrogen is a really good way to store you know, clean, clean fuel from uh, clean energy alternatives like solar power. And to do this, use a proton exchange membrane electrolyzer where you do uh, the oxygen evolution reaction of the anode. And these four protons will cross this proton conducting membrane called nathion to the cathode where you evolve hydrogen. But it turns out actually the oxygen evolution reaction limits the rate at which you can um, produce hydrogen because you can't produce hydrogen without producing oxygen. So to do this, you want to develop a catalyst that makes this reaction a lot faster. But because these proton exchange membrane water electrolyzers are extremely acidic. It turns out really the only catalyst that's active and stable in them is iridium. And looking at this bar chart here, we see if we want to have um, hydrogen power on a terawatt scale, we need 400 tons of iridium yearly. And we mine less than 10. So it looks like iridium, at least in the way we use it now, isn't going to be a very good option if we want to catalyze our anodic oxygen evolution reaction. So what I'm studying actually is, I'm studying the development of a monolayer iridium catalyst, one atom thick, to minimize the iridium we need to do the reaction because normally it takes a, quite a thick layer to actually do water splitting. And to do this, I've developed a synthetic route to an iridium monolayer, and it's pretty simple. You can, you can spin coat um, um, a metal oxide called ATO onto a metal oxide substrate called FTO, and actually then just, soak that substrate in an organic solvent in an air-free environment with this iridium dimer. And it turns out you actually have a surface limited reaction where you can have these iridium sites bind to your hydroxyl groups on your metal oxide and then anneal away the organic ligands. And even better, it turns out after annealing, we have more hydroxyl groups that can initiate more binding of iridium if that's what we want. And looking at this plot here on the right, 
it's just a reaction run under a few different conditions. And you'll notice in a non-polar solvent like toluene, you see that this line, it drops quickly and then it levels out. And what that's showing is the reaction as it drops, we're binding a radium to the surface of our catalyst. But when it levels off, we know we're no longer binding a radium. And it's kind of a way to like show that we do have like a monolayer of iridium on our surface. But you know, so far we've made something, but who cares what you made something? Does it do something, right? And so we did, we ran some electrochemical measurements on our catalyst. And this uh, plot here is called a cyclical tamogram. And basically what we did is we swept a potential on, um, after we made our catalyst into an electrode and measured the current response. And it turns out when you normalize that for mass, we have a much more active catalyst uh, denoted by the earlier rise in this line here, that like even the quote unquote state of the art or radium oxide nanoparticle catalyst that people currently currently use in you know industrial water splitting. So that shows us you know that we can make this really low loading iridium catalyst that can outperform even what's now considered the state of the art iridium oxide catalyst. And further we got a little bit greedy. We said well that's really active but can we get more active? And to do this we actually used a technique called atomic layer deposition which basically just allows you to really precisely deposit other metals onto a substrate. And we use uh, TiO2 or titania. And it turns out through uh, modulating the electronic structure of the catalyst, titanium oxide even further enhances the activity of our monolayer iridium catalyst through the, the same uh, um, experiments. But unfortunately, looking at this unstable catalyst architecture plot here, we see that this top line here is the potential we're applying. And when, these, when this potential goes up, these bottom, you see spikes in these lines at the bottom, and that signifies tin and iridium falling off the surface. And I see them almost out of time. And um, so in conclusion, you know, we're realizing that we can synthesize these low loading iridium catalysts on metal oxide supports with atomic precision, really controlling the thickness of that layer. And that we can observe significantly increased intrinsic activity However, the catalyst remains unstable. And lastly, I want to thank my mentors, Dr. Shannon Betcher and PhD candidate Raina Karina, as well as the Phil and Penny Knight campus for celebrating scientific impact for giving me really generous funding to do this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, we have JJ Yin with determining how S100A9 activates TLR4 using evolutionary and biochemical approach. Um, excuse me, sorry, I thought that I was gonna go soon. Thank you, yes, thank you, Ed. My, oops, <laughs> my bad. Let's do Ed Venice first. Isotopic fractionations produced during direct air capture of carbon dioxide, thank you. And were we able to share or um, turn on our cameras? Is that allowed? I believe you are allowed to, yes. It's not letting me, but that's okay, it's not a big deal. Well, Ellie will troubleshoot. Go, go, why don't you get started and uh, Ellie will try to. I'm on it. Thank you. All right, well, can you see my screen right now? Yes, it looks great. Okay, perfect. Um, so anyway, um, I worked with Ellen Olson and Jim Watkins to understand isotopic fractionations uh, that are present in carbonate minerals that have been growing uh, upon contact with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so for a little bit of background, isotopic fractionations are a way of understanding the ratio of heavy and light isotopes that are present in different compounds. Um, the kind of isotopic signature, um, oh, here, now it looks like I can start my video, let's see. Um, cool. <laughs> All right, um, anyway, so these isotopic fractionations can tell us something about the isotopic signature of heavy and light isotopes that are present in different compounds. Um, this isotopic signature will essentially tell us, the, can tell us the conditions in which, you know, for example, a mineral may have formed, um, which can be enlightening for understanding environmental conditions from possibly millions of years ago, uh, if you were to analyze a sample that was created you know, at that time. Um, so essentially, we are looking at really unique and interesting isotopic fractionations that are produced in these specific carbonate mineral formations known as travertines. Um, so going down here, might even zoom in a little bit because uh, there's just way too much text on this, so I apologize. Um, going down here, uh, so there's a specific site in Northern California where meteoric water uh, that's very high pH and pretty much carbon-free is bubbling up through ultramafic rocks. 
And once it, once it reaches the surface and interacts with the atmosphere, a carbonate mineral crust is forming on top of that, um, as you can see in these pictures here and here. Um, so once, once people discovered this and, and analyzed uh, these minerals, these travertines that were grown there, uh, they analyzed them isotopically to try to understand what their isotopic composition was. And the interesting part of that um, was that it produced this large array <clears throat> of isotopic fractionation. Um, whereas we would expect, you know, at least within some of these, these travertine samples to have a pretty similar isotopic fractionation, whereas instead we saw such a large range. Um, and what's further interesting about that is that actually uh, there is a one-to-one -one covariation between the oxygen and the carbon isotopes. So it forms this, this you know, slope here, this one-to-one -one slope, which is further intriguing and begs the question of why is all this happening? So the idea here is that by understanding what is causing these different fractionations that are occurring in uh, carbon and oxygen isotopes, uh, we can more clearly understand and use isotopic fractionations to understand paleo the paleoclimate conditions in which they have formed and understand the different variables that control all, these, all this variation. So what we did is we tried to simulate that, uh, what was happening in nature by taking a calcium chloride solution and sealing it within a beaker within a water bath um, in order to then control all the different parameters that we saw in nature, to try and recreate them kind of one step at a time so that way we could understand what causes, you know, these different strange fractionations. Um, so uh, we had our solution, we uh, evacuated the headspace using nitrogen gas, um, and then we brought it to a high pH. Uh, once it was at the high pH to kind of, which high pH being similar to what was found in nature, um, then we administered carbon dioxide gas uh, into the into the headspace, which would then form this calcium carbonate crust, just kind of on on top of our solution here. Uh, so once we did all that, we would take we would scrape off the crust and we would analyze it both uh, isotopically and we would also analyze it just visually with a scanning electron microscope. So what that gave us, uh, so here on the left are all the SEM images, uh, scanning electron microscope images. Um, and we were just looking at them visually. So we don't have, some of them are still uncertain until we do further like a compositional test to understand what some of the different carbonate minerals that formed were. But there were obvious things such as calcite um, and aragonite, which we were able to see clearly and we were expecting to see. Um, and then there are possibly is another uh, polymorph known as vaterite uh, that we may have found. Um, but what this tells us is that we were indeed growing these carbonate minerals um, and we can, and, it, and it's promising, it's, it's what we were looking for. Um, and so then here's a picture of what uh, a finished experiment actually looks like. Uh, I, I didn't mention, but it says here that we usually leave them running for about two to five days. Um, and so after we took it down, <clears throat> it would look something like this uh, with this kind of thin calcium carbonate crust. Um, and so then that's what we looked at the pictures of and then we analyzed isotopically. And we found, we've only analyzed about half of our experiments so far isotopically. Um, and we found that actually the very first experiment we did produced isotopic fractionation signatures closest to what we found in nature over here. Um, but uh, unfortunately that first experiment being that it was the very first one, it didn't actually maintain a high pH over the course of the reaction. So it's not quite representative of what would happen in nature. So we can't, we can't really rely on that. So we tried some other things to try and fix that. And so we're hopeful that in our future evaluations of, of the isotopic fractionations, we will have a better idea um, Just a few seconds to wrap up. Okay, cool. So then essentially, uh, like I said, we're hopeful that the, the later reactions that we haven't quite analyzed um, will actually produce fractionations that are much closer to what we're finding in nature. And then we can understand which of those variables that we controlled um, are affecting the different fractionation values. Um, and then just the last little bit here, we another fun kind of like bonus to this research is that um, by forming these carbonate minerals, we're actually sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, which is a really popular thing in, in climate change and, and climate change science right now is trying to figure out ways of reducing the CO2 levels. So we have this promising idea of maybe we could use this for some kind of carbon sequestration technique. Anyway, thank you. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, and my apologies again for for skipping over. Um, no, no problem. <laughs> uh, JJ Yin, take it away. Okay, um, let me try to share my screen. Um, I think, Ed, maybe you need to stop sharing. Yeah, sorry, I just stopped sharing. Yeah, 
Thank you, thank you. Okay, everybody can see my screen. Be wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is JJ, and today I'll be talking about determining how S109 activates TR4 using evolutionary and biochemical approach. The immune system activates um, inflammation in response to both foreign pathogens and internal damage. This regulated inflammation can lead to many chronic diseases such as cancer. LPS is found on gram-negative bacterial cell membrane and activates TRR4, which is a pro-inflammatory um, receptor that causes inflammation. And the mechanism of this activation is well studied. Interestingly, S109, which is a protein expressed in the immune cells in the host, has been found in high concentration in inflamed tissues of many of these chronic diseases. Sounds odd. And it turns out that S109 strongly activates TR4 as well as LPS. It intuitively does not sound good because it would mean that our own protein is activating our own inflammation mechanism. Therefore, um, understanding of how S109 activates TR4 would be useful to create therapeutics to treat such diseases. And that's why I'm asking why, oh, sorry, not why, how and when did S109 evolve to gain such of an ability significantly? Based on the previous research that has been done in the lovely Hanf lab, we have the data that's shown in the blue bars right here. We see a trend that chicken S109 activates TR4 much, 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 much lower than opossum S109, lower than mouse S109, lower than human S109. We also see that chicken diverged in the evolutionary tree of life right here, earlier than opossum did, which is this guy, earlier than mouse, and earlier than human. That makes us wonder if there would be a connection between the two. So my hypothesis is that S109 evolved to gain abilities to more strongly activate TR4 in the ancestral of marsupial mammals, which is right here um, in between opossum and chicken. In order to test this, I am trying to characterize more S109 from modern mammalian um, mammals that diverged more distantly from human, for example, koala, platypus, and echidna using transduction functional assay, which we're not going into that today. In my expected results, opossum and koala S109 will have similar ability to activate TR4 because they are closely related in the evolutionary tree of life. They are um, both marsupial mammals. Platypus and echidna are closely related themselves. So they should have pretty close activity um, in comparison to themselves. They also diverged before the ancestral of the marsupial mammals, however, after chicken. So their signal would be expected to be much lower than opossum and koala, however, higher than chicken. When comparing um, opossum TR4 with human TR4, the three new species would be expected to have higher activation towards opossum TR4 than human TR4 because they are more closely related to opossum than to human in the evolutionary tree of life. If my data appeared to match my expectations, it would support my hypothesis and indicate that um, S109 may be actually evolving alongside with species following the evolutionary tree of life. If my data actually appear to not match my um, expectation, it would mean that my hypothesis may not be correct and we need further investigation to explore the evolution of S109. My further direction would be continuing to characterize these three new species and reconstruct. And after that, I will have enough information from my mentor, Sophia Phillips, and I to reconstruct the phylogenetic tree of life um, because we have an existing tree of life that has been constructed by the Hans lab. Using those new, um, new modern day species data will give me hopefully 
helped me to construct a more accurate and useful tree. And then we would decide which ancestor to look at and do site direct mutagenesis to that specific ancestor. And then hopefully that will tell us more about which amino acids is functionally important. That would be it. And thanks to the lovely Hans Lab. Nice work. I think you were right at five minutes, right on the dot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, all of you have been so professional and impressive in your knowledge, um, and I'm excited to get into the Q&A portion with you, uh, but before we do that, we have uh, plenty of time left, um, and I know I, I kind of kept you on pace, so did anyone feel like uh, there was uh, some part of their presentation that they had to skip that they would like to revisit briefly? Would anyone like uh, just an extra minute or so? Okay, seems like we're all pretty content. So we can address any questions or anything else uh, that maybe you didn't have a chance to say during the Q&A. Um, and we have three questions that have been asked in the Q&A already with written responses. Um, you uh, viewers out there, you're welcome to uh, ask additional questions um, and we can kind of just turn our cameras on if you'd like and have a conversation. Um, I'd love I'd love it if the panelists, the the poster presenters, might ask each other a couple questions. So here's a new question that just came in from um, Ailey Egling. Faith, you mentioned in your presentation that NBD, oh boy, theoethers. Now again, I'm a humanities librarian. Uh, are tunable, and I was wondering what exactly you meant by tunable. You had an amazing presentation. Yeah, would I be able to share my screen again? Um, yes. To explain that answer. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so what I mean by tunable um, is this NME2 group um, is what can be exchanged. So by tunable, that pretty much just means we can switch it out with other R groups um, or carbon groups. Um, so NME2 is a donating group and we picked a donating group because up here, this product um, has a negative sulfur um, and we wanted to make sure that the reaction was going to be slow enough um, that we were able to get good initial data from because we knew that the reaction was going to be pretty quick. Um, and as you can see, this happened, um, these reactions occurred in about 20 seconds. Um, so we added a donating group um, to try and destabilize this product because donating groups can't stabilize negative charges very well. Um, so by having that, we're destabilizing um, this product which then is going to make the reaction a little bit less favorable and slow down that reaction. But if we wanted um, to switch it to a withdrawing group, which we could then tune it um, to change the reactivity and like change it to a withdrawing group um, to stabilize that sulfur, that negative charge, it would really drive the reaction forward um, and make the reaction much, much faster. So pretty much what I mean by that is just changing out that, um, that R group right here, which we do by changing this starting material to then change the reactivity, which is why it's really helpful um, when we're trying to figure out the speed of a reaction and things like that. Thanks. Um, Faith, would you also like to speak to Hannah's question that you answered already um, in the Q&A uh, about the pro having problems with HS attacking your receptor? Yeah, so our receptor starts to degrade, um, like I said, after about two hours um, with that T-bash, with that, um, sulfur in, in the solution. So um, pretty much we don't have to worry about that um, too much because like I said, the reaction is super quick. Um, it occurs in like 20 to 40 seconds. Um, so we don't have to really worry about too many adverse reactions with our receptor um, in this particularly. But if our reactions were a little bit longer, which at the beginning of my project, I did have some reactions that didn't even occur um, in that two hour time frame. So then we had to kind of switch starting materials. Um, but in that case, if the reaction um, did proceed for much longer, then we would have to start worrying about those um, attack of the sulfur in the receptor. Thanks. Thank you very much, Faith. Um, Layla, would you like to talk about the question that Hannah asked? Would you like to go into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, so just to quickly 
So I have a question for you. Um, Hannah, I'm wondering what are the benefits of studying proteins in the gas phase rather than in liquid or solid states? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So thank you for that, Hannah. Um, I think one of the main, so there are a couple of answers that I could give. Um, I'd start off with one of the nice things about these techniques in the gas phase is that the amount of sample that you need to use is relatively very low compared to other techniques. Um, it's a lot faster also. And then the nice thing is that these are, I mean, you don't have like, um, you know, like aqueous solutions or something like that in the gas phase, but you can still learn a lot about the, the structure of the protein. Um, some, you can also using like native mass spectrometry, you can learn about uh, the mass of what you're working with, um, with, with no ambiguity, which is also nice. Um, so these are just like some of the, the nice things about the gas phase technique um, as opposed to some other ones. Awesome, thanks. Um, and since uh, we just have one more of uh, the typed questions right now left, uh, I'll ask Nathan to address Hannah's question. Um, and then y'all can ask each other some questions if you'd like. So uh, Hannah says, wondering whether or not you and your lab have thought about other ways to attach ATO to your FTO, given the fact that while spin coating is practical for small academic scale, it couldn't be used at an industrial scale to say, make solar panels for the whole world. Yeah, so that's a good question. So actually in reality, if you wanted to make this uh, process scaled up, you'd want to do it on nanoparticles, not on those planar surfaces that we did it on. And this reaction does work on nanoparticles. And in fact, the catalyst you get is actually even more active. The reason why we did it on a planar substrate is when we're doing these three electrode half cell measurements, it's not like a proton exchange membrane electrolyzer. You basically have this electrode sitting there in a vat of acid is what it is. And things can literally just mechanically fall off. And in your proton exchange membrane water electrolyzer, everything's sandwiched together and pushed really hard against each other. So nothing will just mechanically fall off. In that situation, the only degradation you'll observe is you'll observe like chemical dissolution, like it dissolves in the acid or something like that. So to like negate that like confounding effect of mechanical failure of the system, that wouldn't happen in real life. We did it on a planar substrate where everything's attached really strongly to the substrate and you're not relying on some nanoparticle to hopefully to stick to an electrode. So, and then in regards to like scaling that up, if you do it on a nanoparticle, it negates the spin coating step and it would be a lot more scalable for like industry use. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for your very thorough answers. Um, do you have any questions for each other? Or any other comments you'd like to share? I have a question for Ed actually. Um, I'm not an earth science major and I've never really, I'm very much chemistry. So I'm curious when you were talking about um, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, do you know what that looks like chemically, like what sort of reaction that is undertaking? Yeah, so um, I mean, I can share my screen again. It, there, it's kind of briefly written out on part of my poster. Um, but I mean, essentially it's just, we're reacting carbon dioxide with, um, with the calcium that we have present in the solution. Um, so let me see if I can share, I can just show you it. Right, so, um, I have it kind of here, um, and I can zoom in on that if it lets me, maybe, yeah. Um, right, so the idea is that um, this is, this is the, ca the calcium carbonate that we're gonna be growing. Um, so we're reacting, uh, first we're taking CO2 and uh, it's undergoing hydroxylation and forming a bicarbonate anion, and then that will then uh, in, in the high pH, we're going to end up with uh, the bicarbonate and then takes us to our calcium and uh, bicarbonate forming a calcium carbonate uh, mineral. So um, it's actually like a really straightforward reaction. We just want to make sure it's at a high pH. Otherwise, we could be forming kind of other things. But uh, we want to make sure that we have, you know, OH is present. So that way we're forming this. Okay. Yeah, I must have like not caught that or something. But 
I, I went over it really, I just kind of cruised past it, so. <laughs> so does that mean um, if you were to use this in a more like broad scale, you would have to put it in very specific environments for it to work? Yeah, so that's actually what, so what our professor Jim was, was looking into was figuring out how if he wanted to like scale this up to be like a practical application of carbon sequestration is what kind of reagents we would, we would also need at a large scale. And uh, the problem is in order to maintain it at a high pH, we're using a uh, sodium hydroxide and potassium chloride solution. And just getting like those at a large enough scale um, would be kind of difficult. Uh, so that's, that's a hurdle for that, but he still has kind of hope that because this is happening in nature, um, you know, to an extent. So if we could use already, you know, high pH solutions that are in nature and things that are occurring in nature like that, uh, then, then maybe we could do it. But yeah, it would be a little bit difficult with our current reagents to scale it up for something, you know, practical at the moment. That's super cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, I think, Ed, you have to stop sharing your screen so we can see each other. Sorry about that. Got it. It's all good. It's all good. Um, any other questions for, for each other or our comments? Okay, I counted to 10 quietly in my head. So last chance. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. I am extremely impressed with you all. Um, and I wish you the best of luck with, with all of your work. And I think we will close this panel early. So thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.